you. You go upstairs, young lady, and take off my dress. You're not my mother. I said move! If you used to watch Lifetime back in the day, you probably remember this movie. And if you've seen Death Becomes Her, you probably love this movie just the same. It's definitely a hidden gem because not a lot of people talk about it, but it's definitely one of my absolute faves. Ruth slash Rose, her husband Bob and his mistress Mary were all a hot mess. This was a tragic love affair gone haywire. Looking at this movie with grown eyes, I'm able to see how this film details the life and trials of a married single mother. And it's a cautionary tale of sorts. But as always, you know I have my thoughts about this movie and you know we're gonna talk about it. So let's get into it. So the movie starts off with narration from our main character, Ruth. She's explaining how there are some people in the world who are naturally beautiful and then there are people like her that need all the help that they can get. Later on that night, her husband has an event to go to and she wants to look her best. So she goes to the mall to get all gussied up and finds a new outfit that doesn't work out too well for her. And she goes to get her nails, feet, and hair done. As she's sitting under the chair at the beauty shop, she sees an interview of the author Mary Fisher. It details her work so far, her pink palace by the sea, her thoughts. Make their man feel important and, and comfortable to let him know that he is the man, so there's no confusion. They even show her mom at her retirement home. What a photo op. Pay attention to all of this, by the way. You'll see why later. But anyway, we then go to Ruth's husband, Bob, who's an accountant and currently swamped at work. Ruth calls him to let him know that she's excited about his event happening later that night. Bob tries to warn her that it won't be fun, but she insists that she wants to go. So later on at the event, while Ruth is walking around, she stops to give her foot a break and she accidentally trips and throws her wine all over Mary Fisher. She's shocked and surprised that it's her, and as her husband walks up, he instantly shoos her away to go find something to remove the stain from her dress. And of course, as soon as Bob and Mary's eyes meet, they instantly fall in lustful love. Merle, Mrs. Steal Your Man Street, strikes again. So as Ruth is excitedly getting something from Mary's wine stain, child mary and bob are walking around the party getting to know each other she's got his jacket on i seriously doubt it was that cold in there one thing you gotta know about bob is that he is a major opportunist he takes their meeting as a chance to promote his services as an accountant and even makes a formal request i refuse to divulge any more information about myself unless you call me bob if you promise to call me mary and then he takes her home while his lovely wife, Ruth, rides in the back seat. Oh wait, and then he drops Ruth off first. There's more, and he doesn't even drop her off at the house. He drops her off at the entrance of their community. Are you sure I'm not putting you out? No, don't be silly. 75 miles is nothing. Bye, sweetie. At this point, Ruth still trusts her husband, but that's not gonna last for long. So Mary and Bob finally arrive to her pink palace by the sea. They come in and she's swiftly greeted by her boy toy, Garcia, but she immediately lets him know that she's trying a new flavor tonight. So Mary and Bob drink wine and continue talking. And as they're talking, she's making a not so indirect move. Writing can be so... Shortly after, it's on, and this starts the breakdown of Ruth and Bob's marriage. From here, we meet Ruth and Bob's kids, Andrew and Nicolette. And why does he have a rat, a gerbil, whatever it is, period. But like, why is it on the table where everyone eats? Just trifling. Anyway, they're discussing why their father didn't come home last night, and Ruth tries her best to provide excuses, but she's obviously bothered and worried. Your brother drove someone home and he probably just blew a tire on the expressway and it got laid. 
child, he comes in the house and surprise. Oh, you never believe what happened. I'm headed home in the expressway and kaboom, the rear tire goes out. So Ruth asks him why he didn't call her and he insists that he didn't want to call and wake up the whole house. He then announces that he landed Mary Fisher's account, <laughs> wonder how, and baby Ruth is pissed because at this point she knows that her husband is having an affair with Mary Fisher. And Bob tries to convince her that he's not, but the evidence pretty much speaks for itself at this point. And Ruth wants the smoke with Mary. Mary Fisher, I hope your pink palace crumbles into the sea. I hope your delicate white skin breaks out in hives and your shiny blonde hair falls out at the root. Yet and still, Ruth tries to continue being a good wife while also continuing to be delusional. Mary Fisher, you're just a fling, an infatuation. Bob doesn't love you. I love you. Ruth, this man got you fixing the sink and doing the yard work too. Not you being a whole married single mother out here child it's safe to say at this point bob is a goner ruth comes up with a plan to make a special dinner for bob to convince him to come and stay home their kids are not excited about what they'll be eating i mean who wants to eat mushroom soup though meanwhile bob and mary are getting more acquainted than ever and when bob tells mary that it's time for him to go home she insists that he doesn't have to go and his home is there with her just forget his wife and two kids, child. They don't matter. Be kind to me. Be with me. Stay with me. Live with me. Mary, I want to. It's not that easy. I've got kids. And they have their mother. We go back to Ruth and she's angrily cooking, putting all types of negative energy into the food. That's why it came out so bad. But Bob finally makes it home and the kids are excited to see him since he's been MIA lately. Are you sleeping here tonight? Of course I am, sweetie pie. Your grandparents are coming over. We're going to have a nice family night. <laughs> That'd be unusual. Bob tells Ruth that he's going to jump in the shower. She follows him and ends up scaring him while he's in the shower. And then he gets out and says this disrespectful miss. Not starting anything. I'm just going to weigh myself. No wonder you're upset. So Bob's parents pull up early before the food is done, and he's pissed. He even warns her not to embarrass him in front of his folks. Real asshole behavior. And as she pulls herself together, she enters the living room with the appetizers on hand, and she ends up tripping on the stairs and falling. And instead of him running to her aid or asking if she's okay, she has to deal with these type of questions from her mother-in-law. Is it that time of the month? Ruth is struggling. She's burnt the cookies to a crisp and everything's barely coming together. She comes back to the table just in time to hear her husband spitting fairy tales and fallacies galore. Ruth and I have a terrific relationship. Always have, always will. Child, why was he fronting so hard in front of the two people who should know him best? Anyway, so it's finally time for the main dish and unfortunately it came with a surprise. Oh my God! Barf. After this grave mistake, Bob throws down the facade and they both decide to let some truths be known. Bob, calm down. Calm down, the woman is a walking disaster area. Why don't you get Mary Fisher to cook your dinner for Ruth, you? I'm warning you. She's his mistress, you know. And after this, all bets are off and Bob goes in. I knew I never should have married her. Rob. Nicole and Andy get up to your rooms. Now, now, now! Bobby, if you didn't love her, you shouldn't have married her. Yeah, she was pregnant. You made me! Poor Ruth. Her life is crumbling brick by brick. But, oh, Bob's not done. He decides to pour even more salt on her open wounds. I have four basic assets, but when it comes to liabilities, I have only one. That's you, Ruth, and I'm not going to let you destroy everything I worked so hard for! Bob didn't know that by telling her this, he set some catastrophic events into motion, and it will all be his fault. So this is where it gets interesting. So Bob takes his happy ass to Mary Fisher's. I guess he said F them kids and F Ruth too. And Ruth finally accepts the fate of her marriage. Mary Fisher lives in a palace by the sea and in love with my husband who's her accountant. I loved my husband and I hate Mary Fisher. So the next day, Ruth makes a simple list of Bob's assets home, family, career, and freedom. And her plan is to attack each one by one. 
So starting with what's first on the list, Ruth decides to destroy their marital home. And she puts major effort into this, putting all types of things into the washer, a blow dryer under a pillow, a knife in the mixer, and puts lit cigarettes in the trash and turns on the gas stove. Is it me? Or is this like felonious behavior? Like if there is an investigation, she would easily go to jail for this. And baby Ruth leaves that house with nothing but a picture of her and the kids. Not any clothes or toys for them. No clothes for her. Not a thing. So the kids come home to find their family home is gone. Mom, what happened? We had a little accident. Poor kids. Their life just got blown up, literally. Ruth and Bob were both neglectful when it came to their kids after the dissolution of their marriage. I'll discuss this later. But anyway, Ruth takes the kids over to Mary and Bob's love mansion and Mary's former boy toy, Garcia, was delighted to lead them to her and blow up her spot. Andy! I found him! Hi, Daddy. Child, Ruth kisses the kids goodbye and honestly, they couldn't have cared because they didn't ask enough questions for me. They were like, cool, bye. But who was bothered though was Bob. Bob wanted no part of his responsibilities and wanted to know why Ruth was forcing him to be a full-time dad when he was too busy living his best life. Okay, Ruth, give you a few days, then you've got to come back for the kids. I'm not coming back, Bob. Where are you going? I don't know, Bob. Into my future, I guess. So now that Ruth has taken care of their home, the next item on the list is family. So Ruth makes a plan to visit Mary's mom at her retirement home and bring her back home to her man-eater of a daughter. But Ruth decides that she needs a new name to fit her new life and as she sits in a diner alone, she sees a woman selling roses and takes this as a sign to call herself Vesta Rose. So from here on out, we will be referring to her as Rose. So Rose finally makes it to the retirement home that Mary's mother resides in and gets a job there. On her first day, she gets the lowdown on how everything works there. But this one rule made no sense to me. You must report any damp or smelly beds immediately. Do you mean incontinence? Bedwetters have no place in the golden twilight home. Child, she's in the wrong business. But anyway, Rose is introduced to Nurse Hooper. From first glance, they have an awkward stare down. Her manager then tells her to follow Nurse Hooper and help her with her daily tasks. Now, Nurse Hooper did not see it for Rose. Hooper was a play by the rules kind of person and Rose was definitely not that. But the good thing about Rose helping Hooper pass meds was that she was able to meet Mary's mom, Miss Fisher. So later on that night, Rose puts yet another plan in motion. She goes downstairs to where the meds were kept and switches the regular meds, which were sedatives, with vitamins. And baby, the next day, their retirement home was jumping. The residents were out playing soccer and Hooper was shocked and appalled. And why did they have those people on sedatives anyway? Ain't that a violation of sorts? I'm sure it is, but Hooper knows that something is amiss and confronts Rose about it. Some kind of way she finds out about the vitamins and informs Rose that she's going to snitch on her. I know what you've been doing, the vitamins. I'm going to report you to Mrs. Trumper and then you'll be sorry. It's a shame though, Hooper. I've always thought that women like us should stick together. Meanwhile, back at the Pink Palace, Mary is struggling with completing her manuscript and juggling her new responsibilities as a stepmom. Nicolette is jamming music all loud and calling herself being on the chat line. <laughs> Child, not the chat line. And Mary has to run over to get her to turn the music down. As she's speaking with her and demanding her to quiet down, Bob calls to check in on her. Apparently, Mary is two months behind on her manuscript and Bob, of course, is not being supportive. You have no idea what I have to put up with around here. Mary, Mary, the kids have been through a very emotional experience. You're their stepmother. You've got to make them feel at home, Mary. Help them. Child, he ain't shit. The manipulation. Ain't these your kids, though? You should be here, dude. Anyway, Mary goes over to check on her dog, who's currently barking her head off. Andrew is playing with the dogs, and when Mary asks him to throw away the stick he's using, this leads to an unfortunate event. We go back to Rose and Miss Fisher back at the retirement home. Her personality has come 
all the way out since she's no longer involuntarily sedated. Rose spots one of Mary's books on the covers and asks whether they are related. She already knows that they are, but Miss Fisher confirms and offers some tea about her daughter. Bitch keeps me in this dog pound while she lives the life of a princess in her goddamn mansion. Rose goes on to tell her how she should go visit Mary if she wants. Miss Fisher rejects that idea at first, but soon comes around to it. Rose even promises to drop her off to the train station herself and see her off. We then go back to Mary, who has since buried her dog, and baby Bob's kids are so disrespectful. They are in her living room, eating all types of snacks, the room looks a mess, and Nicolette had the nerve to have on one of her blouses, just a complete mess. Mary suggests that Nicolette wash her clothes if she doesn't have anything clean to wear, and Nicolette tells her that she doesn't know how. Mary then tries to take this task to her mate, who is honestly over all their asses at that point. Fuzzy has just shit all over the carpet. Uh, perhaps Miss Fisher would like to clean that up and it a little laundry? No, 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 that's all right. And since that didn't go over well, Mary tries to get Garcia to do it, but Garcia is too busy living his best life on her dime. You're still the butler. So get in there and get to work. I may be the butler. But I'm not the maid. Somebody should have helped her because she pours so much bleach on those clothes. How can you smell bleach and think to yourself like, oh, I'm going to need a lot of this. The strong ass smell alone should let you know not to. But she does. Child, she going to have everyone in that house seeing stars. But Mary is on her way to having a true meltdown. Now would somebody please get the door? Somebody please get the goddamn door! Since everyone else can't be bothered to answer the door, not even the hired help, Mary has to answer, and it's quite a surprise waiting on the other side of that door. Mother, hello, your royal highness. You better pay for the taxi. Back at the retirement home, Rose sets forward another part of her plan. She sets up Miss Fisher to get kicked out and have her reside with her daughter permanently. Meanwhile, Mary, Bob, and the kids are getting ready to have dinner. As the kids come over, Nicolette sits down at the table and her clothes look a hot, scalding mess. And we don't have to wonder too hard how they got that way. What's the matter with your clothes? <laughs> you did the laundry. Oh yes, must be something wrong with that machine. Mary's trifling ass didn't even think to invite her mom to dinner, but she ends up making it down anyway. And the kids are not too excited about their dinner options. What is it? It's potage creme de raisin. What's that? It's French for dog puke. Bob goes on to try to kiss up to Miss Fisher, but I bet no one thought that by doing that, that she would unleash so many family secrets. You would think a 41-year-old woman would have learned to appreciate her mother. Mary, I, th I thought you were 34. Ah, she's 41. I got the birth certificate to prove it. Child, all Mary's tea is coming out, and there's even more to come. Wait for it. But as Miss Fisher continues to go on and on, Mary finally snaps, which finally puts Miss Fisher on mute for the time being. We go back to Rose and Hooper having a silent, awkward lunch. How's your lunch, Hooper? Adequate, thank you. Yeah, Hooper wanted no parts of that conversation. But things quickly change when Rose pulls out an eclair out of the box of treats. Hooper decides that it just might be worth it to chat with Rose after all. Try one. And baby, that was all it took to get some info and the beginnings of a friendship out of Hooper. While eating the rest of the sweets, Hooper tells Rose that she's been at the retirement home for 22 years, but doesn't plan on staying there forever. She pulls out a secret stash of $55,000 that she's saved so far. Since she lives at the retirement home, she doesn't have any expenses, so she's able to stash pretty much all of her money, which is fantastic. But me being the cautious person I am, I have to wonder why does she volunteer this information with a stranger? She didn't know Rose from a can of paint, and you done told her all your business? Girl, gotta be quicker than that. But this lovely convo ends abruptly when their manager finds the trap that Rose set up earlier on Miss Fisher's bed. This is long-term leakage. How long has this been going on? 
I didn't want to tell you. Poor Mrs. Fisher. No excuses. You're fired. Where is Mrs. Fisher? Child Rose would have had me messed up. How you gonna set both of us up like that? She had to catch me outside. Meanwhile, back at the Pink Palace, Mary has an interview with People Magazine and she makes sure to warn her mother to stay in line. Garcia comes by to drop off some appetizers, but they were not up to Mary's standards at all. This man brought out some cheese whiz, crackers, and yoo-hoo to the table. He been showing out ever since she brought Bob in there. So the interview begins, but it's quickly interrupted by Garcia's antics. Yeah! Phone call! The disrespect. He's not even answering phone calls. So what does he do exactly? But anyway, the retirement home manager has called to inform Mary that her mother is no longer welcome there due to her alleged incontinence. And Mary needs to know one thing. Well, what am I supposed to do with her? What I've done with her for the past 10 years, put up with her. And while Mary attempts to swallow that not so good news, her mother is giving this reporter all the tea. Are you saying she was promiscuous? Promiscuous? She was a teenage tramp. She couldn't get enough. She got knocked up when she was 16. Really? Chris? Uh, yeah, come here. Poor Mary. She comes back out the house like it's business as usual, not knowing that her life is about to be blown up. So, tell me about your son. Miss Fisher, smile. <gasps> Child. At this point, we're quickly finding out that her whole life is a facade. So we go back to Rose who is saying goodbye to all the residents as she leaves out for good. She makes it to the bus station and prepares to move on to the next step in Mission Takedown Bob. And as she leaves out, guess who shows up to join her on her adventure? What are you doing? I don't know. I thought you might have a plan. Child Rose gonna put Hooper's 55K to use. So Hooper and Rose partner up to start a staffing agency for women. They purchase the building, fix it up, and to promote their new business, they go on top of a building and throw down hundreds of paper ads, just making a big old mess for the street sweepers. But this promotion ends up working and they are able to get a diverse group of women in their office, all with their own unfortunate stories of being used and discarded by their husbands or boyfriends. They even create a commercial for their business. They are coming up in the world. Love that for them. Meanwhile, of course, Bob is up to his old shenanigans and Rose is creeping. It's time to attack Bob's career. So Rose sets up the next part of the plan by leaving a suggestive ad for her staffing agency at his place of work. And since she knows her husband so well, wait, I just realized that he was still her husband at this point. But anyway, since she knew him so well, she knew the perfect person to match him up with. Men go crazy when I tell them my name. It's Olivia Honey. My goal is to work for a powerful, successful man who makes lots of money and marry him. Baby, Olivia showed up to the job in her best Trapper Man attire, had the women in their office shocked and appalled. And of course, Bob fell for the bait quickly. You're hired. <laughs> Meanwhile, in Mary's world, she meets with her publisher anticipating that she likes her new manuscript, but not so much. I don't know what to say, Mary. We extend a deadline after deadline. Then you give us something called love in the rinse cycle. I mean, you don't love it. And she continues to go in and you can see the confidence being drained right out of Mary. And darling, what is this whole chapter on laundry? It's a metaphor. A what? A metaphor! Her publisher lets her know that if this is the best she has to offer, then it's a no from her and she won't be publishing her book. And you know Mary was not trying to hear that. Are you going to publish it or not? Not as is. Fine. You see Mary, we're only Fine. doing this for your own- Fine! And when her publisher lets her know that she's looking worn down, tired, and dragged through life, Mary decides that she's finally had enough. You look tired. Go get a facial. Is there something wrong? <gasps> there you. And if her day couldn't get any worse, 
She walks by a newsstand that is stocked <laughs> with her tragic People Magazine interview and she swiftly grabs all the issues and throws them away. Like that will actually stop people from reading it all over the world. Meanwhile, Rose is reading this same issue and ends up seeing a pic of her kids who she hasn't seen in months at this point. I don't even think she called and checked on them kids. At least they didn't show her doing so. But here's our third act update on the current state of Mary Fisher. Mary Fisher lives in a palace by the sea, but her life is no longer a fairy tale now that Prince Charming works late every night. And Bob is knee deep in another woman. Got Mary calling him, wondering where he is, and she's looking a hot mess too. And when she goes over to see what Garcia is up to, she walks in on him doing this. Does this even count as exercising? What is he doing? Child. Later on that night, Bob finally makes it home and he almost got in unnoticed until his beeper started going off and the familiar excuses began. Sorry, honey. That friggin' jag blew a fan belt on the way in. You know what I'm thinking? You know, it might be safer if I spent a few nights in the office. And Mary doesn't even want to hear none of that because she's pissed about the issue still. Jesus Christ. We're going to sue the bastard. We're going to need all the help we can get when love and the rinse cycle comes out. And that was the straw that broke the camel's back. Why is everyone turning against me now? First Paul, I refuse this to publish it. Now you tell me you hate it. Bob is just twisting the knife deeper and deeper at this point. I don't hate it. I just don't know why you strayed from the formula. In case you don't know it, Bob, I'm an artist. And the whole time he's talking to her, he has a whole kiss mark on his neck, just living dangerously on the edge. But their little spat turns into a big argument, which motivates Bob to willingly sleep on the couch. Sad Mary Fisher. <gasps> She's learning that men who burn so hot for a mistress cool off fast when the mistress starts acting like a wife miss fisher her mom is living for it though child anyway so rose goes off to meet her plant miss olivia honey and get an update on her current assignment olivia lets her know that things are going well and she's interested in dating her boss but she's unsure on if that's the right move girl you already gave it up to him. You a little late, sis. But Rose urges her to tell her boss how she feels. Now, whole time, Olivia doesn't know that her boss is Rose's estranged husband and she's being used to set him up. But Olivia takes her advice and as her and Bob are doing what they do best at the job, after hours, she finally decides to risk it and tell him how she feels and you can just about guess how that turned out. I love you, Bobby, I do. I really, truly love you. The next day. I told him I loved him and he fired me. He accused me of trying to sleep my way to the top. This was such a mess. Just set that poor girl up. But while she's trying to comfort her, Olivia tells her some tea that's almost too hot to sip. So apparently, Bob has been cheating his clients by skimming the interest off their accounts and wiring it to a bank in Switzerland. And that's all Rose needed to hear, cause sometime after, her and Olivia decide to team up and take Bob down professionally. So Olivia had learned all the access codes to Bob's client's accounts and still had a key to his business. With that, Olivia and Rose were able to wire 200K from each of his client's accounts and wire them to his Swiss bank account to make it more obvious to his clients that he was essentially stealing from them. And while Olivia was doing that, Rose ended up finding the scans from Bob and Olivia's fun night and decided to put them to use. So we go back to Mary, Bob and her publisher who are at a book signing and it's safe to say that her book is a utter and complete failure. And if her day couldn't get any worse, as they arrive back home and check the mail, Mary opens up a random letter and finds the sexy scans from Olivia and Bob's office love sessions. And she goes off. You bastard! Oh! Mary, come back here! You know you're the only woman I've ever been faithful 
too. If things weren't already going incredibly bad, Mary takes another hit when her maid walks out. Miss Fisher, up with this bullshit I will not put. I quit. Oh, no, 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 no. And then this creepy ass scene. What are they doing? Ain't nobody thought to question this behavior. That's a whole child. The fuck? And when Nicolette tries to challenge her, let's just say it doesn't end well for her. You go upstairs, young lady, and take off my dress. You're not my mother. I said move! And then she moves on to Andrew. You go upstairs. You stay there. You're grounded. Oh, and Bob can get some too. Really, he deserves 99.5% of the smoke. Whoa. I'm taking back control of my life, Bob. And while Mary is laying down the law back at the Pink Palace, Rose is about to make things even stickier for Bob by getting the IRS involved with his money scheme. So later on, while Mary is having a party at her home with all her rich friends, and as Bob makes an inauthentic toast to Mary, in come the popos to arrest him in front of everybody for fraud and embezzlement. And Miss Fisher is elated. Bye bye, Bobby. <laughs> oh, now he wanna cry. Got him where it hurts. But Mary and Bob go to visit their lawyer and discuss their options, and it's not looking good. We're looking at two to three hundred thousand dollars in fines. That's a lot of money. Plus two to five years in prison. But everything might not be as bad as it seems. Turns out that their lawyer is in good with the judge that will be hearing his case, and there's a good chance he will get off. As the lawyer details how they are going to set up his case to show that it was a software glitch and nothing that he did intentionally, he says something that inadvertently puts the final nail in Bob and Mary's relationship. To ram home the idea that the whole thing was an accident, we can show that the largest transfer of money came from Mary's own account. We all know that was a mistake, right? Mary was over it. Bob disrupted her peace. His kids destroyed her home. He was cheating on her. And to top it off, his ass wanted to steal her money too. Oh no, he's got to go. And finally, Mary sees him for what he is. Mary! No way, I'm glad that this happened. Because now I get to see the real you, you sleazy son of a bitch. I want you out of my life. Oh, and you're fired. And Rose intercepts once again by calling in a favor from an old friend and switching the judge that's here in Bob's case. Thus, the last part of her plan, freedom. It's a wrap for Bob. He just doesn't know it quite yet. Court, Court therefore, therefore finds Robert Patrick $250,000 and orders him to serve a prison term of 18 months. Baby, his life flashed before his eyes. Karma came around slow, but when it finally hit, it hit, and he has an instant breakdown. You promised I'd be okay. Uh, no Phillips, problem. I, hey, why don't you, your dad, Judge Phillips, and I get together for a round of golf? I'll be free and say, 18 months! As Bob's being hauled off, he sees Ruth slash Rose sitting in the back of the court and calls out for her. Like, what was she gonna do for you? She definitely wasn't gonna save you. She was the one who put you there child so from here we fast forward to several months later mary fisher ended up selling her pink palace i guess she didn't want any memories of that place i wonder if she kept her mom around or not they don't say bob is in jail burning everybody's dinner for the night just a mess he ends up getting a visit from ruth and the kids and as ruth walks away to give him some time to bond with his kids bob makes a small gesture I get out in a couple months, maybe I can come visit, cook you all dinner. That'd be nice. Ruth, girl, don't you fall for it, he'll never leave. And don't nobody want his trash cooking anyway, not even the kids. But anyway, we get a slight update on Mary Fisher. Turns out she switched it up completely and is no longer writing romance novels. She's keeping it real now, y'all. She wrote a new book about trust and betrayal and it's a success. And while she's at a book signing that's going way better than her last, Ruth shows up to have her book signed, but Mary doesn't recognize her to the last minute. She's instead thrown off by another possible love interest. Your grasp of the postmodern metaphor is wonderful, Mrs. Fisher. Please, 
Call me Mary. Ciao. And that's the end of the movie. And here are my final thoughts. Bob was a cheater, a scammer, and a schemer. He was forced into a marriage by his parents due to him getting Ruth pregnant. He never loved her and it showed. He was always looking for a way out. And when Mary showed up, he saw a pathway and he ran. He didn't even think about it. There was nothing to consider, not a marriage, not his kids, nothing. It was all about him. And the crazy thing was once he got his out and the kids had to come along for the ride involuntarily, he got tired of Mary and looked to find his peace elsewhere. When it all boils down, Bob didn't want marriage or those kids. He wanted to be a free single man. Before the kids showed up, he was fine being with Mary, but as soon as his responsibilities followed him to his new home, Mary lost her fun vibe and his eyes and heart went elsewhere. I don't even know why I just said heart, because baby, Bob didn't love nobody. He was stealing from Mary and his clients from day one. And he was so messy, just could care less. Coming home with lipstick stains and prints on his neck and shirts, pulling up with shitty excuses he didn't even get creative with them just recycled the same ones and he never took accountability for his shortcomings or any of his wrongdoings not till he had to when he went to jail he never tried to be a good dad till he went to jail he never saw it for ruth until he went to jail i really hope she divorced him and moved on with her life because bob truly proved to everyone how he simply couldn't be trusted and as for Ruth, I feel bad for Ruth. She was giving her all and unfortunately it was never going to be enough for Bob since he never wanted her in the first place. She bared the weight of managing the household, taking care of the household duties, taking care of the kids, putting on a happy family front for her in-laws and the outside world. She was doing way too much for someone who couldn't even spare her their bare minimum. The way he openly disrespected her, had a random woman walking around a party with his jacket on, had you riding in the back seat of your own car and dropping you off on the corner, girl, like what was going on and she still trusted him she still was like that's my man and i'm gonna stick beside him but when she finally heard him say out of his mouth that he didn't love her and the way he did it i think that confirmed what she had been feeling and then the way he just continued to pour salt on her wounds she was like nah i'm gonna show you and she did she destroyed everything he cared about and he willingly provided her a blueprint of that and honestly both of them neglected and abandoned those kids and basically pushed them off on mary bob did it from the first night he met mary and ruth did it when she dropped them off at mary's after she burned the house down bob and mary weren't even married and bob had mary carrying on like she was their stepmother i think not all in her house, running off her staff, bringing her creativity down, messing with the funds, child, I couldn't. And Mary's ass and her whole imaginary life, round here abandoning your mom, hiding a whole child, lying about her age, just a mess. But yeah, that's it y'all. Thanks for watching this review. And if you would like to check out this movie, it's actually free to watch on YouTube. I put the link down in the description. Please like, comment, and subscribe, and I'll see you next time, you guys. Bye.